All right, Revelation chapter 19. I'm getting kind of motivated now, you know, you get towards the end of, you, know, you start out in the book of Revelation and, you know, looking at this thing going, okay, Revelation for Bible-believing Christians, the, you know, how to exhort, how to, you know, go through it and what can we learn for today, instruction and in righteousness for today for Christians. And it's like, you start out in chapter one and it's like, oh boy, <laughs> 22 chapters of this. This is going to be difficult. And it's taken me a while to go through this. I mean, I'll, I'll read through it. You know, I don't even know how many times. I'm not going to set numbers because then people go, wow, and they, you know, think that's great. Um, you know, <laughs> but it takes a while to go through it and just read over it and read over it and read over it and pray. And, okay, Lord, you know, because the temptation is always there to try to explain exactly what's going on. And some of that is okay, but I'm trying to go through this as exhortation for brothers and sisters in Christ out there. Not so much as a, you know... Um, study on exactly what it's what events are going to happen, but uh, let's start out here, verse one, Revelation chapter nineteen, verse one. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, "Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God." Okay, there's a group of much people in heaven. Wait a second, no, this can't be right because you see, Jesus comes down to the earth in verse 11, down through verse 21, on chapter 20 there, he's on the earth. So that can't be right there, because there's no people in heaven before Jesus comes back at the second coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a, gr uh, a uh, great voice of much people, much people in heaven. Okay, so at the very least, you'd have to say post-trib is definitely false. Post-trib rapture, people get caught up, you know, before the, or be, be, get caught up, I guess, they teach that after the tribulation, right as Jesus Christ is coming down, you go up and, you know, the divine U-turn, up and you get mounted on horseback and come right back down. Totally skipping the marriage supper of the Lamb and the judgment seat of Christ. They skip those two things, you know, and they'll try to duck it by saying, well, yes, see, but it's an eternity, so there technically is no time there, so we could go up and have all that stuff happen and then do the U-turn and come back. <laughs> Crazy nuts. But, you know, at least the mid-tribbers are smart enough or crafty enough, I'll say it that way, to say, well, no, there's, you know, people are there be before, you know, this chapter 19 takes place. You go up in the Revelation chapter 6 or something like this. Problem is, Revelation 6, you compare that to Revelation 19, it's the same account. Just a little bit different details. Jesus Christ coming back down to the earth. You know, and, and then they'll mock the rapture believers because they'll say, well, you believe in three comings of the Lord. You know, the secret rapture and then the second coming. So the second coming would actually be the third coming. And then they turn around and teach this, the, a slight variation of that in that Jesus Christ comes back in Revelation 6 and then he goes back up again and then he comes back down in Revelation chapter 19. So Revelation 19 still in their system is the third coming. Cuckoo Nuttyville. That's what we call it. Okay, there are three groups that will be present in this time here. This much people. Okay, I'm going to show you. John chapter 3. Probably going to end up being a two-part study today because there's a whole lot of stuff to go over. John chapter 3, verse 27 through 30. And I'm in pretty, a pretty good mood today, so I'm probably going to talk a lot. John chapter 3, here's the first group that will be in heaven. John chapter 3, verse 27, John answered and said, John the Baptist speaking, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. The Bible says that the law and the prophets are until John. Okay? So the Old Testament system there ends with John. And then the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, there those two kingdoms are preached at that point in time. All right? 
Now, the kingdom of God can refer to the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven, the physical, okay, say it this way. The kingdom of God can mean spiritual or physical kingdom. Talked about that in other studies. But the kingdom of heaven never means a spiritual kingdom. It's always the physical, earthly kingdom on the earth that will be here in the millennial kingdom. Okay? Understand that. And why was it preached then? Because Jesus the king was on the earth. Okay? So, John the Baptist is the end of the Old Testament. Officially the end of the Old Testament. A new dispensation comes in with John the Baptist. With John the Baptist preaching this new gospel of the kingdom. All right? That gospel is rejected when they reject Jesus Christ and it's put off till, you know, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about it, the gospel of the kingdom being preached in all the world. Okay, so it will come back in the time of Jacob's trouble there. But the Old Testament ends with John the Baptist. And what, do they, what does he call his group? He calls them in verse 29, the friend of the bridegroom. All right, so what are the groups that you have, say this before we continue, what are the groups that you have at a traditional wedding? You have, of course, the bride, you have the groom, the man and the woman there that are getting married, and then you have the groom's family sits over on this side or whatever, and then you have the bride's family and they sit over on the other side, okay? So you have basically four essential groups there. Bride, groom, or groom, bride, we'll say it that way. Groom's family, bride's family. So the Old Testament saints, according to our text here, those Old Testament saints that end with John the Baptist, okay, and he says he must increase, but I must decrease. The Old Testament system there is now over. It's ending. They are the friend of the bridegroom. So that's the first group that's there in heaven. Of course, we know who the, the groom is. That's Jesus. And the bride is his church. Let me show you that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. It says here, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, one of the most difficult things that you will face as a Christian is other professing Christians. And they will come in and they will try to get you away from the simplicity that is in Christ. They'll come in there and they'll say, So, your salvation, um, did you pray a prayer? Because prayer is a work. <laughs> and you go, Prayer? Huh? It's a work? What? Huh? Well, wait a second. But I, the, oh, see, you know, and, and things. And they'll, they'll come in and they'll, they'll twist the scriptures all to pieces and they get you so confused, you know. Salvation is easy. It's not difficult. Okay? Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? Yes. Okay? Do you want that life of sin for the rest of your life? <laughs> you know, there's things that you've messed up on and, and just made a wreck of your life. Do you want to keep doing it or do you want help? You know? Well, yeah, I'd like help. I'd like to have, you know, the, a changed life here. I want to get out of this, this system that I'm in. You know, did you know Jesus died for you? For someone like me? He'd save me? You mean, he knows about all that stuff I've done and he, he died for me? Really? Yeah. Ask him to save you. Call upon him. He'll save you. Really? <laughs> yes. And he'll give you a new life. What a wonderful thing. Simple. But you see, the serpent comes along and through his subtlety, I'm a Christian too. Well, of course I read the King James Bible. But can I just... I'm concerned for you because I think that you're getting into a movement that is dangerous. I mean, that people mean well, but it's, it's dangerous. Can I just show you a few things? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Trying to mess you up. Why? So that you get away from being a chaste virgin. You start to get drawn into the world. You go over to uh, Mystery Babylon, you know, the uh, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Start hanging around the wrong crowd. You know what I mean? 
Yep. So there we see, I mean, obviously I don't have to read any, you know, verses about the, the groom, so to speak. You know, we know about Jesus Christ. Although I will say you can read Ephesians chapter 5 and see about the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church being compared to a husband and wife. All right. Uh, we're not going to go there for sake of time. But um, what about this other group? Okay. We have the friend of the bridegroom. Okay, Old Testament saints, they're the friend of Jesus, representing John the Baptist and back through. Okay, they're the friends. We have the bride, the church. I realize I don't make a very attractive bride, but, you know, spiritually speaking here, you know. Um, but what about the time of Jacob's troubled saints? Go back to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, where you can read um, verse 4 down through uh, verse 8. You have the 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, 144,000 that are sealed of the Jews there. Uh, not spiritual Jews or whatever else, physical Jews. Then verse 9, After this I beheld in lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples, people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Okay? Uh, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. You say, well, wait a second. I don't see where they would be the friend of the, of the bride. How do you figure that, Brian? Um, well, let me just say this. What is going to be the greatest influence on those people that get saved in the time of Jacob's trouble? Because most of it's going to be early on. They're just going to be going out and killing them like crazy. Uh, I really do believe that. You read about Revelation chapter 6. The one seal is open and he looks and he sees under the altar the souls of them that are slain for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Uh, what's going to be the big deciding factor for them to get saved? You. As a Christian. So, how, what? 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 Huh? your witness, your testimony. Because when the rapture happens, you're leaving. And they are staying. All these false Christians and things like that and false people and whatever else, right now they kind of look at you and condescendingly laugh at what you believe and whatever else. They're not going to be laughing when the rapture happens. And I've said this before. I realize if people take pleasure in unrighteousness, God sends them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Okay? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I understand that. But you also have to understand, a lot of these people that you rub shoulders with and whatever else, um, some of them, it's not that they take pleasure in unrighteousness, it's just that they haven't heard, it just hasn't sunk into their head, even if you're trying to witness to them. I mean... You know what I'm talking about. There's people that you've tried to witness to and you're just like, oh, you're just desperate. I just want to talk about the gospel. And every single time you try to bring it up or you try to get it in there or whatever else, the subject gets changed, some phone call, somebody walks up and starts talking to them or whatever else, and you're just like going, oh, like I just want to tell them about the Bible. I just, whatever, you know. You haven't been able to clearly present the gospel to them. They haven't clearly rejected one way or the other, you see. Those are the people that when the rapture happens, they're going to remember you and your testimony and your life. And they're going to remember that you were truly their friend. And they're going to get saved. And they're going to get up there to heaven and they're going to say, I'm here because of you. Because of what you were back there in my life. And then the rapture happened and I went, that's what they were trying to warn me about. They're not a terrorist or they're not a, it wasn't a UFO abduction or whatever the lie that the media is going to be spewing about why we've left. They're going to say, that's that rapture. That's what they were saying. I thought that they were crazy. I need to be saved. So that whole group that's going to get up there, they're going to be there and they're going to be the friend of the bride. I firmly believe that. I believe that that's why there's going to be a great multitude that gets saved in that time. Because right now, there aren't that many people that are going to be leaving. You know it. I mean, a lot of you out there, you're just like, 
I have like nobody that wants to be around me. <laughs> I have like no friends, you know, whatever. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. And I'm just like bursting inside, just like, can I show you what the Bible says? Can I, can I, can, I, can we talk? Oh, wow. You know, and they make excuses or whatever else. They're going to remember when the rapture happens. Interesting. Back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19 and verse 2. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. All right. What can we learn from that? Well, turn your Bible to, Rev or to yeah, Revelation. Romans chapter 12. True and righteous are his judgments. Romans 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 18 and 19. It says here, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Is that what you desire as a Bible-believing Christian? To live peaceably with people? I do. I do. There's sometimes I have to fight. There's sometimes I have to, to make a scene or whatever else. But I really truly do desire to just live at peace with people. I mean, I got, you know, there's Catholics all over the place up here. A very strong Catholic area in, in northern Maine. I don't ever go out and fight against them or anything else. I try to live at peace with them. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. When is that vengeance going to be happening? In the time of Jacob's trouble. And those people are going to realize, I mean, think about what the rapture is going to do. There's no more theological debating anything. It's all over. The saved went up. The lost stayed down. Argument over. Well, I'm a I'm a Roman Catholic born and raised and baptized and confirmed and and you know ordained and blah 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 blah. You're here on the earth. You're lost. Well, I, um, um, I'm I'm the the pastor of the largest independent fundamental Baptist church in North America. You're here on the earth. You're lost. You understand? I'm a Calvinist. Are you here on the earth? Yes. You're lost. I'm an Episcopalian. I'm an Arminian. I'm a um, whatever. If you're here on the earth, you're lost. You see. And those people realize, uh-oh, I just went into the time of Jacob's trouble and I'm going to be facing God's judgment and God's wrath. What a quick motivation to get saved. Right? <laughs> Unless, of course, you're post-trib, then, you know, you don't think about these things. Go back to Deuteronomy. So when you saw there in Revel or Romans chapter 12, um, it says, as it is written. That means it appears in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I think I might have said Deuteronomy chapter 12, but <laughs> chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32. We'll see about this thing of where does this uh, thing of vengeance is mine, where does it show up? And uh, it's a rather interesting place that it shows up. Deuteronomy 32, verses 31 through 43. It says here, think of the Roman Catholic Church as we're going through this. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense, 
their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. The Lord's judge the great whore. Roman Catholicism's judgment is coming. And we're going to be cheering it in Revelation 19. Very interesting. Verse 36, For the Lord shall judge his people, time of Jacob's trouble, and repent himself for his servants, when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. The Lord's going to shorten the days before the elect's sake. The Bible talks about. Verse 37, And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Peter? Where's Peter of the Catholic Church? You know, Apostle Peter standing over here and he says, uh, here, I'm, I'm right here, Lord, I'm, I'm Peter. The Lord says, yeah, but you know, you're not the Peter of the Catholic Church down there. So, a different Peter. But uh, verse 38, Which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. A little sarcasm there from the Lord. Where's your holy church now? Yep. Verse 39, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. We're going to see that as this, you know, towards the end of the study. For if I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives, from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. The Catholic Church has shed more blood than any other system ever in the history of man. Uh, that's why I hate Catholicism. I don't hate Catholic people. Low-down Catholic people that have, you know, lower down and the whole structure I'm talking about. I don't hate them. They're deceived. Uh, they have been lied to. What I hate is these pedophile priests that are out there raping and molesting children. What I hate are the torture masters that have tortured and murdered just millions of people down through the centuries. That's what I hate. And that's what I want to see vengeance come upon. And by the way, the worst time of killing for the Catholic Church is yet to come in the future. And they're, you know, I mean, you look, you start to study this whole thing and you start realizing the Catholics are in so many key positions. You're not going to get into key positions in government or media or whatever else unless you're tied to the system somehow. Freemason, Jesuit, Catholic, Knight of Columbus, Knight of Malta, whatever. Knight of the Equestrian Order. You can go down through the list. Knight of Columbus, whatever. But that time of vengeance is coming. It's not up to me to go and hunt down Catholics and kill them. I'm not going to drive into the local Knight of Columbus lodge or whatever else and go and destroy everybody in there, kill everybody in there. I'm not going to do it. Why? That's God's job. God is the one who's going to bring that system down. Go back to Revelation 19. You can get upset at it, at what's going on in this world. But our job is to preach the gospel. That's what we do. Stand against the evil, expose it, talk about it. But it is not our job to go out and uh, wage offensive war. Um, defense... That's a different story. Uh, obviously, if a bunch of pervert priests come here to try and mess with my son, um, they're going to wish they never came here. But, uh, you know, me going out after them, not going to happen. The Lord's going to come after him, And nobody's going to stop him. Verse 3, Revelation 19, verse 3. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. The eternity of eternal damnation okay there's there's uh you know there's no question about that in scripture this teaching of annihilation or uh you know that you just kind of burn up and that's there you go and, and or just that hell's not even real there's not 
even any literal fire there and whatever else. Uh, wrong. Absolutely wrong. Revelation 14. Again, if you're new to this whole thing, haven't really seen many good scriptures for it, I'm going to show you a real good one here towards the end of the study too. But Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Again, Satan in his subtlety, these people come along and they'll say, well, when it says smoke rising up forever and ever, and they have no rest, it's talking, and they'll twist it. It's just like, just read it as it stands. Babylon, back here in Revelation 19, verse uh, 3. Her smoke rose up forever and ever. That's not, you know, if it's just, oh, well, you know, the people and the city and things. Uh, it's not going to burn forever and ever. Okay, it's eventually going to burn up. It's talking about eternal torment. That's what it's talking about there. Let's look at the contrast here. Eternal torment, first in hell and then the lake of fire after the great white throne judgment. So you have eternal torment for the lost, but what do you have for the saved, the redeemed? Verse 4, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Eternal torment for the lost, eternal worship for the saved. Eternally worshiping Jesus Christ. No uh, worries about wearing your Sunday best and getting to church on time and things like this. You're in it all the time. And you are today. You know, it's not just something in eternity. All right. We don't put on a little pageant and say, oh, it's time for church. Let's put on our happy faces and go to our social club. I mean, <clears throat> uh, I didn't mean to say social club. I just, actually I did. But, you know, no worship all the time going to be great can't wait for it not have to worry about looking around going oh that guy's here again i don't know if he's saved or not you know <laughs> that guy's an infiltrator i think you know no in heaven brothers and sisters in christ we're all there you know because lord you know saved us not going to be any fakes up there verse 5 revelation 19 verse 5 and a voice came out of the throne saying praise our god and Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Hmm. So you mean uh, true praise of the Lord requires fear? Yeah. How does that work? Glad you asked. Go back to Proverbs chapter 9. How can you praise somebody that you're afraid of? Well, I'm going to show you. Proverbs chapter 9. There's a whole lot of verses we could go over with the thing of the fear of the Lord. But I'm just going to give you three passages here. Talk about the fear of the Lord. Three verses, actually. Looking at it here. Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You say, well, I don't fear God. Well, then you're not wise. In fact, you haven't even begun on the path of wisdom until you learn to fear God. A um, good way to do it is to go to some big waterfall or some big canyon or whatever else and just look at that thing. And then realize God created it. The awesome power, you know, I remember years ago my wife and I went to Niagara Falls. We had a chance to go there. There was a sister in the area and she actually gave us a kitchen table. And uh, she said, you know, can you just come and pick it up? And had, she had an apartment and people just left and, and they left their furniture, a lot of it. And so I went in there and we were like, yeah, this is great. You know, we didn't have a kitchen table at the time. So we went there and got it. And she like lived like, I don't even know what it was, walking distance, you know, to Niagara Falls in New York State, you know. And uh, so we went there and, and it was just like you get, you know, close to the edge. You're like walking over to the railing and you're like, whoa, okay, yeah, whew. 
you know, <laughs> it's all this huge, you know, just, I don't even know how many millions of gallons of water going over that thing, down, you know, just way down there, and boom, you know, and everything. And you look at that, that awesome power, and you go, wow, God made that. All this hurricane and stuff like this, you know, this uh, Irma and things was 500 miles wide or something I heard. And it was like 37 days at sustained wind speeds of 180 plus miles an hour, you know. And people are like, this never happened before. Yeah, that's nothing compared to God. And I find it interesting too, the Bible talks about God speaking to Job out of a whirlwind. Most people say it's a tornado, but a tornado or a hurricane, either one's really bad, you know pretty interesting. I wonder if God's trying to speak to America right now with all these hurricanes hitting. Do you think? You know? I think so. But uh, you need to learn to fear God. You need to learn there is a God and He created things and I'm accountable to Him. And of course I could say a whole lot more on that but we're going to continue here. Uh, Proverbs 8 Verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. What is your attitude towards evil? Do you hate it? You know, all this stuff out there, it just cracks me up. This, this, uh, we have to legislate, you know, hate crimes and, you know, this is, we have to get rid of hate and all this other stuff. That is insanity. You have to hate things. Do you hate child molestation? Well, do you hate viruses? Do you want to kill viruses? Or would you rather just have a deadly virus come into your body and just don't do anything to hurt it? <laughs> you know, of course not. If you have any sense, you're going to hate things. You're going to hate things that are evil. And as a Christian, you definitely need to hate things that are evil. Not people. Okay, I understand that. Going out there and just hating people, wanting to kill them and stuff like that, if they've wronged you or wronged other people. Vengeance it belongs to the Lord. Okay, I understand that. But this thing of uh, you're not supposed to hate anything, uh, that's the realm of mentally sick people. And of course, they're deceivers and liars and hypocrites as well because they hate you for standing for the Bible. And they want to put you in prison and they want to shut your mouth. Why? Because they hate, you know, they hate you, they hate me. So, but if you fear God, you will hate evil. Next, let's go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 9. Psalm 19, verse 9. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Hmm. Ties in perfectly with Revelation 19. Isn't that something? Old Testament lining up with New Testament. You can go back to Revelation 19. It is a clean thing to fear the Lord. You say, well, brother, my life is far from being clean. I got a lot of dirt in my life and I got a lot of problems and things like this. Okay, you can clean it up by fearing God, hating evil. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see how it works? I mean, the creator of the universe, he knows what works for your body, for your life. And when he condemns something, he says, thou shalt not. Don't touch that. Don't eat that. Don't look at that. Don't listen to that. Don't this, don't that. He knows what's best. And when you fear God, you don't succumb to peer pressure. You don't say, well, everybody else is doing what does God say? You see? He's against that, then I'm going to be against it too. Why? I want to clean my life up. You know, if you're a young person out there, or anybody really, because I realize it's not just the young, but if you looked at pornography and you defile that brain of yours, I'll speak from experience. I did it for years and years and years. I was wicked. Looked at all kinds of perverted garbage. How do you clean it out of there? The Bible. 
studying things from the Lord. Become obsessed with Scripture. That's the only way to clean out that brain of yours. You get your thought life back. And I'll grant you, you know, if you think hard enough, you can probably try to remember things and whatever else. But you get to a point where you're just thinking about Scripture all the time. It'll clean up the thought life. But what's the motivation for cleaning it up? The fear of the Lord. It's clean. The fear of the Lord is going to keep you from fornication. From getting some dirty, sexually transmitted disease. Because you fear God. The fear of the Lord is going to keep you out of prison. Why? Because you're not going to steal. You're not going to murder. You're not going to disobey the laws, the just laws of the land. Say it that way. Because there's a lot of laws that are they're trying to pass that are not just. Um, you know, Obviously, if they come in and try to force you to do some kind of thing for sodomites or whatever else, well, you say no. You say, well, it's a law. I don't care. It's an unjust law. All right. Fear God, you see. Go off on that for a while. But let's get back to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Okay? Omnipotent means all-powerful. Omniscient means all-knowing. Omnipresent means he's everywhere, <laughs> all present, you know. Interesting. And, you know, I have a theory, and I'm just going to say it's a theory. I'm not going to be able to prove this from Scripture, you know, without doing some big study, and maybe I could prove it, maybe I couldn't. But my theory is, I believe that people on earth, the wicked on earth, are going to hear this, you know, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. I think that they're going to hear it. Heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings saying. I think the people towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble are going to, I mean, the Bible talks in Revelation 10 about the mystery of God is finished. And I think that people on the earth, there's not going to be any question anymore that God is real and that the saints are up there. And they're going to hear us up there yelling, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Again, I'm looking forward to that. Game over for the lost world down here. Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Hmm. So they go on to say that. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. All right. Um, how does she make herself ready? Two points I want to make here. She has to make herself ready. How's that happen? Uh, the judgment seat of Christ. All right. Let me show you that real quickly here. We're not going to. I'm going to be redoing my old study on the judgment seat of Christ in the future here at some point in time. First uh, Corinthians chapter three. I don't actually have this in my notes, but I want to show you something here. 1 Corinthians 3, uh, verse 11, we'll start there. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Uh, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. All right, the purification there that happens is not purgatory. This isn't you suffering and atoning for your own sins, and you eventually get in if people here on earth do enough masses for you and stuff like this. And, if you've prayed enough prayers and done the rosary enough, no, 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 no. This trying by fire is your works that get tried. You don't get tried, right? Your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But what you do after salvation, the life that you have lived, that is going to be tried. Your motivations for living for Jesus Christ will be tried. Were you serving the flesh? Well, that's the wood, hay, stubble. Or were you serving the Lord? the gold, silver, precious stones. 
All right. So that's how his wife makes herself ready. Back to Revelation 19. But here's an even more important point. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, verse 7, and his wife hath made herself ready. Um, and the woman that's there that eventually will become his wife, his betrothed, his engaged fiancé. Nope. She's called the wife before the marriage supper. What can we learn from that? If you're saved, you're already part of the bride. You don't have to worry about uh, coming out of that. All right? It's not that Jesus Christ, you know, is getting along with you for a while and all of a sudden he goes, yeah, you know, um, I got to tell you something. It's not you, it's me. I think we should just be friends. <laughs> no, nope. You're already ready to be married to him. It's just the formal ceremony, the marriage supper of lamb, which we're going to be reading about here. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. Verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Isn't it amazing how people reject the Bible and yet they copy it? I mean, you know, not all of them. I realize there's people that are just doing, you know, the, the new cool is just to do things completely different than anybody in the past has ever done them. You know, so you get a, uh, I mean, Lord only knows what goes on at these weddings nowadays, but... If you want a traditional wedding, that woman's going to be wearing white. Hmm. And yet a lot of times you get atheists that are getting married and they're being married in a white dress like that. The woman in white. They're copying what happens in the future in Scripture. Very interesting. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Who are the ones that are called to the marriage supper? i got to switch pages here. Notice it's not, Blessed are they that get married. It's blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Is there a place in Scripture where someone is called to the marriage supper? Invited. Yes. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, physical kingdom there, be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. They're called. We'll see that here. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him, not marry him. And I'd like to also point out the fact that there are ten virgins. Jesus Christ gets married to a chaste virgin, one woman. Jesus is not a polygamist. All right. Verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And people try to exposit this and they say, well, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. You mean you can, you can buy the Holy Spirit? No. That's not what it's talking about here. Verse 10, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein, wherein the Son of Man cometh. Unless you look at the stars and can tell the constellations, tell you that it's September 23rd, 2017, or if that fails, it'll be 2018 or 2019, or we'll just keep moving the date back like Charles Taze Russell did, founder of the Jehovah's Witness cult. <laughs> okay? 
had to put that in there. But the blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. We just read who's called. And um, does it say anything in there about that they had faith in Jesus Christ and put their faith in Him and saved by grace through faith? No. It's works. It's all what a heresy. What, what heretical things. The gospel's always been the same. The gospel's always been the same. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. Verse 34 through 36. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. I didn't see anything in there about grace through faith believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know why? Because like I've been saying, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, towards the end of the book of Revelation, the events that are going on there, there's no more faith. They're seeing things. The mystery of God is finished. So it becomes a works-based thing. That's why Matthew chapter 5-7, through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, it's all works. Nobody's putting their faith in the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. It's works. The king is on the earth. You see. But a lot of people in their pride just refuse to accept these things and they just say, well, uh, uh, and they just twist the scriptures, twist them and twist them and twist them. Just, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not, faith isn't mentioned there in Matthew chapter 25, but it's it's there in the Pauline epistle, so it has to be here too, and, and so we just we'll just kinda ignore that. Yeah, smart. Back to Revelation nineteen, verse ten. It says here, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not. Wasn't a very good Pope, I guess. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay? I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Why would an angel say that? Go back to Matthew 22. Again, another very big study, which I can't get into totally here, but Matthew chapter 22, verses 29 through 30. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God, like lost people. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Okay? So, I believe in the resurrection, we're going to be angels. That doesn't mean we're going to have wings. Okay? So, and again, it's, I, and people say, well, it says as the angels of God and stuff. And, you know, whatever, whatever. We get, get into the whole thing there. Like I said, it's too big of a subject to really get into here. But you see it in Revelation chapter 5. Uh, you see the 24 elders. And you go back to Revelation 19. And you see the great multitude of angels. Okay? Uh, the Christians, those that are redeemed. You know, again, the angels are called the sons of God in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, you know, First John talks about, now are ye the sons of God. All right? So, that's what I believe on that. But it's interesting that he says to him, you know, uh, first of all, he says to him, see thou do it not. You know, I fell at his feet to worship him. See thou do it not. Don't worship me. That's the natural, you know, belief system of a Christian. They don't fall down in front of me. Don't worship me. Again, another proof that the Catholic Church is completely wicked. Not only do they not have a problem with people falling down and worshiping them, they suggest it and they require it. Yeah. I mean, even the, the whole thing, all the occult symbology of the Pope, you know, people go to, to meet him and the women have to wear all black and they wear a black veil and stuff like this and the Pope's there in white and everything else and stuff and they give their little gifts to each other. 
Where's the stuff at in Scripture? It's not there. But notice the other point here, verse 10, Revelation 19, verse 10. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now again, if you're keeping up with some of the stuff that's going on, uh, this faker Robert Breaker came out, rhymes and everything, and he came out and he said that uh, Jesus, you know, he didn't know what was going on in Matthew 24. That's why he said, no man knoweth the day or the hour. Um, but it's been revealed later on. And then he points to some kooky prophecy given by a Roman Catholic about the Revelation 12 sign, and he tries to make things add up so September 23rd comes out, even though he did that back in 2015 and failed, and then he does it again in 2017, you know. And he says, well, Jesus kind of gave it, but he, he wasn't aware of when it was going to happen and stuff like this, leading you to believe that, you know, it was kind of like further revelation would be later on given so people would know then. <laughs> um, Jesus, when he was talking in Matthew 24, he's giving future prophecies for the people out there in the future. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, you see. And people in Matthew 24 are not going to know the coming of the Son of Man. They're not going to know. And by the way, Matthew 24, verse 36, I think it is, where he says about no man knoweth the day or the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. It's talking about the second coming. It's not even talking about the pre-trib rapture. Okay? So the guy just has no clue what he's talking about with Scripture. Um, he basically studied under Ruckman and probably some others and things too. And he's trying to pretend that he's a Bible-believing Christian. Preaches a false gospel. Watch out. Whenever you see rapture date setters, and they're not saying it will happen on such and such day, let me show you right here in the scriptures. They're not speaking with authority. They're being very ambiguous. They're saying, um, well, it, you know, there's a possibility that it might be, you know. I remember Paul Begley did this thing. I did a video against him. Uh, this is another false prophet. And he said, the tribulation will start, I forget what year it was, in one of the years, in 2014 or something. And he goes, it will start. 50% chance. <laughs> like, what? You know, 50% chance. And God told him this, you know. I don't think so. Go to Matthew. Actually, we'll go to Matthew 24. Let me show you this. Because this is important to get this. I want to show you here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35 and verse 36. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Okay, what's the distinction there? There are certain things that are written, pre-recorded in Scripture that are going to come to pass, and we can know it. There are other things, it's not revealed. God has reasons for not revealing it. And so you get people that try to get into those things, into those areas that are mysteries, and they're doing it because they want people to worship them as a great authority. You know, that's what's going on there. Let me show you. Revelation 9. Go to Revelation 9, verse 15. <clears throat> Revelation 9, verse 15. Check this out here. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. Well, praise God. Right there it is. I mean, it just it's spelled out plainly. They're prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year. There's no question. There's definitely some day there that is going to be the fulfillment of this scripture. So if we get that day figured out, then we can figure out when the rapture is going to happen and the Antichrist will show up and the... And the um, but there's no day given. There's no clue. But God is showing, I got it all worked out. Okay, Lord, tell me when it is so I can, you know, get really big views in the video and stuff like this and, you know, make a little bit of <clears throat> AdSense. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I don't monetize my channel. I'm making fun of Breaker, you know. But my point is, God's not going to show you that. There are certain things He says, hey, it will come to pass at an exact time. I got the thing planned out. Don't worry about it. But I'm not going to let you know the day of it. Let me show you something here. Uh, another thing. Revelation 10, verse 4. Just to demonstrate this. 
Revelation 10, verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which, which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. There are certain things, brethren, that the Lord doesn't want us to know. The Lord does not want us to be able to understand Him in the sense of the Godhead. There are things that you just look at and you go, okay, I can see this, you know, and I see here in this verse, Jesus says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Over here, He's seated at the right hand of, of the Father. Huh? Well, you know? And you look over here, it says, The mystery of godliness is great. Hmm. Well, I guess I can't be a smarty pants and understand the whole thing, so I just have to say, I just believe what the Bible says. What an original thought, you know? When's the timing of the rapture, brother? What day is it? What, when do you think it's going to be? The Feast of Trumpets? or the, Is it going to be in the springtime? Or is it it's up to the Lord? I don't know. You know? Revelation 19. Come back there. I mean, if you're watching this, this channel here, trying to find some kind of an authority here that's, I'm, I've got some new revelation that, that nobody else has seen that's, you know, you can't plainly see in the King James Bible, uh, you're watching the wrong channel. This is a Bible-believing channel. Holy Bible above all the junk that man's written. Verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness, righteousness he doth judge and make war. What did we read there earlier? Uh, where is it? Verse 2, For true and righteous are his judgments. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, if I went out and I tried to bring justice upon the Catholic Church right now, I'd probably get, you know, I'd probably kill some innocent people. Okay? Innocent people get caught in the crossfire and whatever else. So I'm not going to do it. I have no plans to do anything like that. It's up to God to avenge things. It's His job to do vengeance. Not mine, not yours as a Christian. His judgment is true and it's righteous. Ours isn't always going to be perfect. All right? But let's look at this thing of Jesus Christ being faithful and true. Romans 1 Romans chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What's the day of the rapture? I don't know. It's got to believe by faith. Jesus is coming. When? I don't know. Well, how do you know for sure he's coming? Because I believe his word. He's uh, faithful. So I can live by faith. I can put my faith in someone who is faithful. You see. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Revelation 19. See how the whole Bible just ties together? I've heard it said before, and I think it's a good statement, that uh, the Bible is actually a picture of eternity. You want to understand what eternal life is? Try cross-referencing things in the King James Bible. It's crazy. This verse ties over to there. That verse ties back to here. This one goes back to the Old Testament. This one goes over to here. This one goes over to there. You can just go on a never-ending loop through this book. Just go through it. It's amazing. God's words are eternal. What about truth? John 17. John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Of course, the posties will get all excited and they say, see, you know, even though they believe that they're going to take, get taken out of the world too, and mid-tribbers, you know, they believe they're going to be going out too. They kind of ignore that, but they say, you know, see, so we're not to be kept from the evil. It's talking about at the moment of salvation. You don't get saved and, boom, leave. No, the Lord's going to leave you here and he's going to let you go through some stuff because you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ, you see. But it's not talking about the coming time of God's wrath and judgment on the earth. Again, we've talked about that in plenty of studies, but let's continue. Verse 16. Uh, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Again, we can be have faith. We live by faith because Jesus Christ is faithful. We can believe in absolute truth. Why? Because Jesus Christ is true. His judgments are true. They're righteous. So we can say, we don't have to be vague. We don't have to be ambiguous. We can say, this is the truth, whether you like it or not. I want to give you the truth. I want to tell you about the truth. Again, that's one of Jesus' titles. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is truth personified. You know, go back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Don't give me this stuff that Sam Gipp came out with, that Jesus is going to be called Emmanuel, and all the, you know, people say, well, that's just a reference to it. He's got a name, you know, there, uh, a name written that no man knew but he himself. Uh, well, the name Emmanuel is in the Bible, so that would not work. Okay. And you say again, what is that? What's this, what's this name? Well, uh, if I could tell you what it was, then uh, I would know. You see? And it would cause the Lord to be a liar here. So I just read that and I go, I don't know. Find out when we get there. It's quite simple. Verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Capital. W. There's only seven references in your King James Bible, right? And the NIV takes out 1 John 5, 7, so they only have six references to the capital W word, the manifest word. Very interesting. But what's this thing about this dipped in blood stuff? Isaiah 63 theme of Revelation 19 is vengeance and wrath and judgment that's coming on this world. You better get saved. You better learn to fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All ties together. Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Talking about the Lord. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people that there was none, excuse me, there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. Have you ever been so scared that you acted like you're drunk? I have a few times. You get so frightened you can't even speak. And your mind just, you don't know what to do. You're panicking. It's such a frightening thing. 
The scariest stuff I've ever been through is spiritual attacks. I've had some really bad ones at times where you're actually dealing with a spirit in the room or whatever else. It's, it is frightening. It's very frightening. I know a lot of you have said about that too. You've had those experiences. Not fun to go through. It's a very, very scary thing. I've had other instances, you know, near, you know, near really bad accidents. And, you know, the adrenaline just pumps through and you're just shaking. And I mean, it, it's, it's bad. It's going to be so bad. This is what you need to get from this. It's going to be so bad. God's wrath and his vengeance at the end there, Revelation 19, it's going to be so bad. Those people are going to be petrified and just stumbling around, uh, just so scared because of the wrath and the vengeance that the Lord is bringing. Why don't you get saved now? You haven't seen enough evidence. You haven't seen enough proof. You don't feel convicted. All this other stuff. You're so foolish. You're so foolish. You know, you better get saved. You say, well, how can I, how can I worship a God like that? Let's keep reading. Isaiah 63, verse 7. I will mention the loving kindness, kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies and according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them in his love, and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Talking about the nation of Israel and how God dealt with them in the Old Testament, you know, that's there. But it's true of all people. The most wicked lost person that's out there in this world gets to breathe air that belongs to God. They get to eat food that ultimately goes back to God's system. They get to walk around in nature. They get to do... God does all kinds of things for them. And in His love, He says, I sent my Son to die on the cross to pay for your sins. You come to me and call upon me to be saved. I'll just take all the bad stuff that you've done and just go, it's gone. I'll wash it all away. Give you a brand new life. Give you a new start. Give you a written word that you can know what, the, what I want for your life. I'll teach you truth. I'll be faithful to you. Love. But you don't want it. You knock God's hand away and you say, no, I don't want that. I'm not convinced. I'm, I, I, I need to come to you with my own intellect here. I need to understand all this stuff. I, and if I can't explain it, I won't believe it. If I see anything in your character, God, that I don't like or I don't agree with or I don't understand, I'm going to reject you. Then you get his wrath. It's just as simple as that. Back to Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 14. Say, so, uh, I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't. I don't want any part of this. I just, you know, this all this blood stuff and vengeance and wrath, and he's stomping on people and things, and just oh, it's terrible. I'm not going to have any part of it. Uh, I don't think so. Verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Uh, who had the fine linen on? That's white and clean. The bride. Verse 8, and that bride mounts up in verse 14, cavalry. Kind of interesting because it's always been a hard thing for me all through the years growing up. To, I always get my two words, cal, calvary and cavalry, mixed up sometimes. But our Savior who died on Calvary is coming back with cavalry. Interesting. Just found that to be kind of a neat thing there. But uh, question. If Jesus is the one that's going to be doing all the killing of the Antichrist army, which we'll see here in just a couple minutes towards the end of the chapter, well, why are we there coming back as an army mounted, you know, to go out and I mean, what, what's our point? Go to Joel chapter 2, back to the Old Testament again, the book of Joel 
amazing prophecy of the end times. Joel 2. These minor prophet books are not always the easiest ones to find ones in. There's some I try to remember where them things are at, and it's just like <laughs> I'm going like page. Oh no, wait, no, it's 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 not it's not past F and I. Okay, it's back and Joel 2, verses 1 through 11. Don't get frustrated, brethren. In other words, if you're like, okay, i got to pause it and look at the index in the front. Don't worry about it. That's the kind of stuff that will happen until uh, you really know the word. And um, Anyways, Joel 2, verses 1 through 11. Let's read about this army. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. They're like drunk. Are scared for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand a day of darkness and of gloominess a day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains a great people and a strong there hath not been ever the like neither shall be any more after it even to the years of many generations redeemed saints immortal were given new bodies at the rapture a fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. So what's the deal? So we're coming back as an army. You know, redeemed saints, you know, the bride of Christ. We come down and we're an army. And we go out and we burn stuff. Mm -hmm. Why are we burning things? Because all the idols are going to be cut off out of the land. All the wickedness, all the sin, everything else out there. I mean, what do you think we're going to get into the millennial kingdom? And here's Jesus sitting on the throne and all of a sudden somebody's like, is that, is that an adult bookstore over there? Hmm, is that a Catholic church over there? And there's a Muslim uh, mosque over there? No, it's all going to be burned. Have you ever wanted to burn down one of these places? <laughs> I mean, just, you know, I'm not advocating and I'm just saying, you know, you see some adult bookstore or whatever else and you think, a disgust. Oh man, just uh, well, that time will come, but only when the Lord says so. Don't go out and do violent stuff like that. That's not our place right now. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, and when He catches us away, puts us through the judgment seat of Christ, marriage supper of the Lamb, we come back. Or excuse me, marriage of the Lamb, suppers on the earth after all this stuff happens in the millennial kingdom, but we come back down to the earth. The Lord goes to Jerusalem and he tells us, his saints, go on out. Gather together those people that survived. I want to show you that scripture as we continue. But let's continue here. Verse 4. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. That doesn't mean we're going to be centaurs or something. The horse, lower body, and you know the horse is back this way, and then you've you know, got the person. No, 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 no. It's talking about we are cavalry when we come back. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They're going to be scared. They're going to be dirty. They're going to be, you know, things are burning. It's, you know, you're going to get blackness on you. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Okay, uh, that's pretty incredible. Okay, when you fall upon a sword, you're going to get wounded. Okay, uh, if you're just a regular man. These are immortal Christians that come back. That's what it's talking about here. Verse 9, They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. We come in and we're getting people and saying, You're coming to judgment. Underground base. Down in we go. Time to go to judgment. Mountaintop cabin. People in the caves. See Revelation chapter 6. All this different stuff. Wherever they're hiding. Come to judgment. I'll show you that here in a minute. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Hmm. 
compared to Matthew 24. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. Revelation 19, we just read. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Nobody. You better get saved. Go to Matthew 25. Went right past it, looking at my notes. Matthew 25, verses 31 and 32. It says here, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. How are all the nations going to be gathered? The Lord comes back down to Jerusalem and says, Hey, everybody is hiding. that made it through the time of Jacob's trouble. Come on over to Jerusalem. They're not going to do it. And they're not gathering themselves. Okay? It's going to be our job as Christians, you know, that we're, you know, conform to the image of Christ and things. And, and we are, uh, and again, I don't understand all how everything's going to work and whatever, but I do know, you know, you compare Scripture with Scripture. We're going to be the ones going out there, destroying the wickedness of this world and bringing the people to judgment. Very interesting. And I can't wait. It's going to be a wonderful time. Revelation 19. The Revelation 19. You can go back there. Revelation 19 and verse 15. Now that we've seen about the armies in verse 14, what that's all about. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. If you don't fear God now, you'll fear him in the future. And if you face that wrath, you're not going to make it. Who shall be able to stand? Yeah. Go back to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12. We'll read it real quick. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. God's going to mock them. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. He does what? He, uh, speaks unto them and vexes them in his sore displeasure. He speaks to them. Remember that. Verse 6, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Comes back to Jerusalem. To rule and reign from there. Gathers all nations to be judged. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Revelation 19. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You better put your trust in the Lord. His wrath is starting to become more and more apparent. God's about done with this country. America is finished. I'm going to tell you that right now. Wildfires all along the West Coast. I think there was like 74 wildfires going the other day I heard. 74 wildfires. Huge hurricanes hitting. Wiped out Houston and stuff like this. Oh, they're still having trouble down there. It's going to take them years to rebuild all that stuff. Billions and billions and billions of dollars. I think it was like 150 to 180 billion 
right in around there. Houston. It goes up through Barbadou and St. Martin and stuff like this and all these islands down there in the Atlantic, you know, just wipes them out. They said St. Uh, no, Barbadou, they said the, the, men, or the prime minister, governor, whatever the guy is, the ruler down there, he said that that island, he said it's barely habitable anymore. Resort. Beautiful place. <laughs> Wiped out. Same thing with St. Martin. Going up through there, making all kinds of damage. God's anger, his wrath is kindled but a little. You haven't seen anything yet. Get saved. Do it quick. Do it soon. Back to Revelation 19. We'll finish up here. Revelation 19, verse 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he certainly is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the greatest king ever. But uh, I've got to just debunk something here. I've heard this. I actually saw this. You know, they said that uh, Jesus is four tattoos because he's got one on his thigh. <laughs> it's like, are you kidding me? You know, on his thigh a name written. Uh, well, you know, maybe I ought to just uh, read the whole verse in context. It's on his vesture and on his thigh. Okay, so it's up here someplace on and then down here along the, that part of the vesture on his leg down there on his thigh. Okay, Jesus is not wearing a mini skirt. All right, he's got a vesture on. All right, he's not wearing little uh, shorts or something like this that you can see his tattoo, his cool tattoo on his thigh, you know, or something like this. <laughs> People are desperate, you know, just so desperate to, to justify their sins, you know. And again, I've talked about it. You got a tattoo back in your lost life or whatever else. Well, you know, okay, it's a mistake, but uh, don't try to justify it and get new ones. You know, Christian witnessing tattoos or something like this. It's an abomination. But uh, continuing, verse seventeen and eighteen. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Isn't it interesting? Oh, I'm a wealthy Illuminati family member. I'm part of the blah, 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 blah. You're going to get saved? You're going to get, you know, repent? Well, of course not. I'm not, a, I'm not going to fall for your religious... Okay. You're going to end up as bird food. Some soldier out there, some king over here, this rich, wealthy banker, this guy here, that guy there, all these people. You're dumb enough to join the Antichrist army. Go out there to the Battle of Armageddon. Bird food. You think some turkey vulture is going to come along and go, Oh, whoa, okay. <gasps> There's the Prince of England there. Oh, I'm not going to eat him. Birds are no respecters of persons, okay? <laughs> they don't care. What a way to end up. I find that very interesting. Verse 19 through 21, let's finish up here. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Going to be there. Can't wait. Verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Okay? Just pause there for one minute. Go over to chapter 20 and verse 10. This is a thousand years later. The devil that deceived them was cast alive into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. A thousand years down there, and the beast and the false prophet are still there, still burning. It'll be forever. Eternal torment is what the Bible teaches. Not annihilation, or not that hell is just the grave or something like this. Nope, don't fall for that lie. But back to Revelation 19, let's finish here. Verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. He'll speak his word, you see. 
and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You want to get in contact with God, I'm going to tell you how to do it. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. Last place we're turning to. Lots of scripture in this study. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God. Do you have the word of God? I do. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This book will slice you to ribbons. It'll convict you of your sin. It'll show you that you need to have Jesus as your Savior, that you can't save yourself. It'll show you how bad this world really is. The quickest way for you to become disillusioned with this world is to read this book. And you'll be happy you did. Because this world is a rotten, stinking, horrible place. Absolutely. And God has given us His Word to guide us. So you can either accept this spiritual Word of God here and let it cut you to pieces spiritually and get you under conviction where you realize, I need to be saved. Or you can reject this book and say that this is just a man-made book. And you can go into that time of Jacob's trouble and you can be part of that Antichrist army. And then the physical sword comes out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. His word comes out and it will slice you and destroy you physically to the point where he's going to be riding down through your blood and your guts. That's Jesus Christ when he comes back. He brings peace through war. The most horrific, bloody war that will ever be. You better think about that. Verse 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. What's the his? The word of God. It's given a personality. How about that? And you want to tell me that you're saved and that you can hate this King James Bible? Sorry, I don't believe it. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Can you physically see Jesus Christ right now? No. Can you physically see the Holy Spirit? Can you physically see God? No. What can you physically see? Him with Him whom we have to do. Right there. I'm going to get the wording exactly right. You have to do something with this book. You're going to throw it out and reject it? Or are you going to say, you know what? This is God's book. This book condemns me. And this book tells me how I can be saved. It's really something. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold, let us hold fast our profession. Yeah. Have faith in God. Live by faith because Jesus Christ is faithful. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the, feelings, with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. I mean, say it this way. There's a trail that winds through the woods. And you look over there at the other end of that trail, and you look at that trail and you go, man, that thing is precarious. It's got a little rope that you got to try to balance on going over there. And there's these big rocks and there's all this stuff. And you look over at this, you know, and there's people just, falling off the edge of the thing and everything else. And you look over at the other end of that trail, that gorge that you have to get through, it will say. And there's a guy over there. He doesn't have a scar on him. He's not dirty. He's not anything. And you go, excuse me, how did you get through there? Did you, get, did you just, were you over on the other side? No, I went through there. Didn't fall once. Whose advice are you going to, you know, try to get? The people that are laying there hurt on the rocks or the one that's over there that never fell once? He went through it, but he never fell. He never messed up one time. That's who my Savior is, Jesus Christ. He's gone through the life. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows what it's like to lose sleep and to feel pain and all the other stuff, but he never sinned. He never messed up one time. 
but you don't need him. I think I'm going to make it okay. I think when I get to heaven, my good works and my you know bad works are going to be weighed out. My good works are going to be heavier than my bad works, so I'm going to get in. And doesn't work. The only way into heaven is Jesus Christ. The only way. You say, what about Muhammad? He fell off the trail. What about Buddha? He fell off. What about all the popes? Are you kidding me? They fall all the time. They're not perfect. Jesus Christ is. Verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The book of Hebrews written to Hebrews in the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to need to find God's grace in their time of need. The time of Jacob's trouble. And if they don't find the Lord, they're going to meet Him. If not at the Battle of Armageddon, if they hide out, don't uh, volunteer for that army, then they're going to have to deal with the saints coming around to get them, take them to the judgment. It's really going to be something. I suggest that you uh, start dealing with this book. Not with Brian Denlinger, not with any other preacher or Christian or whatever else out there. You deal with this book, this holy Bible. That's what you need to deal with. So that's going to be it for Revelation 19. Um, this went really long because this is a big chapter. This is my favorite. Revelation 19 is my favorite chapter in the entire book of Revelation because it ends right. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to heaven in the streets of gold and everything else and God wiping away all tears and everything. But you know what? I want justice. I want some vengeance done for the things that I know have happened in this world for the pedophiles that have gotten away with things and the, and the innocent families that have been tortured by the Catholic Church and the, and the wickedness and the lies and the deception and all the wicked, just, just oh my word, evil stuff. Revelation 19 sets it all right. Just sets it, just, Lord takes care of it. Justice. I can't wait for that time. So, I'm going to end it here. Um, and I guess we're going to go on to chapter 20. I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get to that chapter. But uh, just a, uh, such an amazing book. And I know my wife and I were talking about this the other day, and I said, can you imagine what life would be like if we had no Bible? Looking at the way this world is going, you know, I said, I wouldn't be online, I'll tell you that. I would, I'd stay as far away from computers as I possibly could. Uh, I'd be out in the wilderness someplace, you know, living off the land is what I'd be doing. Still a big part of me that would like to do that, believe me. Uh, that was always a dream of mine and things. And, and uh, But uh, we have a book that tells us what's coming, tells us what's happening, makes sense of this world. And uh, well, if you're not saved, please, please get saved soon. So that is going to be it for this study. I thank you for watching. Please keep us in your prayers.